This talk is more sort of high level. Let's start thinking of some ideas of other ways that we can use WordPress in different types of sites. You know, we have obviously the uh, original WordPress as a blogging platform, and people are talking more and more about WordPress as a CMS. But it's also possible to use the tools that are there to push WordPress beyond into a platform for building web apps and, as a result, you know, be able to develop these applications very, very quickly uh, because you don't have to spend time building a new admin panel. You don't have to spend time building new users' functionality. All of that is already there. And this talk sort of came out of a conversation that I was having with some automaticians back in uh, Albuquerque when we used to live in New Mexico and they said, you know, this is the exciting thing we see coming down the pipe and I said, well, that sounds interesting to me too. So a little bit about me. It's me and my wife and our dogs, so that's our family and uh, we just moved out to New England from New Mexico. I, I started my coding with HyperCard back in 1990. Anyone else in here a HyperCard user? Oh, that's good. <laughs> I've been doing PHP since 97 and started developing with WordPress and CodeIgniter in 2006. So CodeIgniter, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar, is a PHP web app framework. That's all that it does. WordPress has some cool functionality there and has been getting closer to uh, uh, being able to run the full spectrum. Uh, and since 2010, I've done only WordPress work and uh, sort of work with the full spectrum from you know, individuals and startups up to large corporations. So, first question is, what is a web app? It has an interactive interface most of the time. So, users don't just read your site, they interact with it. Uh, you know, they, they're using it like Gmail for sending out their uh, emails. They're using it like Basecamp for interacting with their team members only. So if you're a logged in user, you're going to get extra functionality. There might be something there for uh, users who are uh, not logged in or they're just browsing your site, but those aren't your core user. Most of your functionality is geared at logged in users. And in most cases, users are looking for instant gratification. They want it to act like a desktop application. They want when you click on something, it's going to react quickly, you're not going to have to wait for a page refresh for everything you're trying to do. So you end up using a lot of JavaScript, jQuery, to uh, try and get to that. So what's a web app framework? It generally provides a standard uh, functionality to allow for rapid development. They take all of the things that have to be done on almost every project and bring it in out of the box so you don't have to rewrite your database security classes. You don't have to rewrite all of your basic tools. It generally provides database tools. So you know, you're gonna have uh, your query checkers. Uh, you're gonna be able to prepare your query uh, easily. It generally promotes a code pattern like uh, most cases nowadays, it's, it's an MVC code pattern. So it's going to push your files into uh, being se separated. So you have your, uh, uh, your logic and your control files separate from your, your files that are uh, generating your HTML, so your views. And it makes your code easy for others to understand. So as a CodeIgniter developer, if I develop something in CodeIgniter, another CodeIgniter developer is going to be able to step in and finish the project if I get hit by a bug. So there are uh, four big players in the PHP framework market right now. Uh, CodeIgniter, Zen, Yi, and uh, Kate. So brings us to what the common needs are in developing a web application. What are the, the general use cases that just about any app you develop has to have. It needs to have user management, and that's built in. You've got WP users, you've got user meta to uh, manage your basic user information, you have login functionality already built, 
you have uh, your session management to keep track of your logged in users. All of that is there already. You don't have to rewrite it. You have special content types. So you have more than just posts and pages. And obviously this is uh, taken care of by custom post types. And you can use these in, in a lot of really interesting ways to uh, relate your content. You need security. And through core updates, you can protect yourself against a lot of vulnerabilities that come out there. And through the WPDB class, uh, just by preparing your, uh, your queries, you're going to be finding most of the uh, malicious code and getting rid of it before it runs. Site speed, just like Ben was talking about. Caching plugins make it easy. There are a lot of solutions. There are a lot of people talking about how we can make WordPress sites faster. You don't have to figure it out on your own. Rapid development. So you can grab off-the-shelf plugins for basic functionality. You can also grab them and use them as a, a starting point. You know, as WordPress developers, most of the code that we write is GPL. So we can take it, we can fork it, we can do what we want with it to make it work for our project. Also, uh, on the rapid development front, we have a lot of these tools built into WordPress already. You know, you have your basic post management tools there. Uh, and that makes it really easy. You don't have to think about the minutia. You can think about the higher level of your app documentation and support, so being able to figure out how to write for your application. And with WordPress, we have the Codex and we have the Forums, which are absolutely amazing. There is such a good support community out here for WordPress, and there are millions and millions of people using it. So any problem you have, you can probably get an answer fairly quickly. SEO friendly URLs. This is another thing that can take up a lot of time in developing an application. And right out of the box, we have pretty permalinks with uh, WordPress, so it's easy to do. But there are also areas where WordPress falls short in, uh, in developing web apps. And so, you know, there, there are some ways that we can work around those. and. Still be able to develop good apps with that. So it's difficult to pass objects around. And one of the big problems uh, with WordPress is sort of the structure of your theme file. There's no good pattern to it. It's not like an MVC pattern where uh, you, know, you have your logic clearly separated from your views. You've got your functions.php file or you have your plugins, and then you have your, uh, you know, your single and your post type. Which takes me to my second point. So, you know, by having the, this code all mushed together, uh, it, it can make it really hard to find what you're looking for, and you can end up compiling extra code every page load if you're compiling all of your functions for all of your site. Uh, that can really slow things down. And one of the biggest problems is with the database structure of, uh, of WordPress. It makes a lot of sense for doing a CMS. It makes a lot of sense for doing uh, a basic blog. But the big issue here is you can't query by your meta values. Meta values aren't a key in the table. So technically, you can. But as soon as your site hits any sort of scale, you're going to get into big trouble doing it. So there are times that you have to look at uh, the table structure. And I know that sometimes they don't like you to do that, but it can make a lot of sense. So what do we do about these problems? So first problem, difficult to pass objects. So one solution is to get it from the database every time you need it. And this is not a very good solution because you end up doing a lot of extra queries. I'm sure that, well, raise your hand if, if you've run uh, you know, a query checking tool on your WordPress install and found you're doing 100 plus queries on every page load. I'm glad I'm not the only one. At least there are a few of us. 
it, it can become very easy to get bogged down with hundreds and hundreds of queries if you're running a complex site. So it, it, you've got to sort of get your data and hold on to it rather than constantly hitting the database. You could create a global variable uh, that is going to have an array of all your data. And this is very much the old school way of doing things. People would log in and you pass them a cookie and that would have all of the information that you need for them. But this is not an efficient way to do it. We don't have to do it this way anymore. This is 2012. So amongst the development community, there are a lot of people who are very much opposed to using singletons. Does everyone here know what a singleton is? Will you raise your hand if you don't? OK. So uh, a, a singleton object is essentially you have one object in your PHP file that exists as a global. So you're accessing it uh, throughout your app. You've got, uh, you know, you, you have, uh, in my case, which I'm going to get to here shortly, uh, uh, I developed a plugin called WP App Framework. And so you have a WPAF uh, object that if you're going to add user functionality, it'll be WPAF users. Uh, and so you, you stay in the same context throughout all of your files. If you have a current user, you can go grab their information anytime. You can also make changes to that user by writing out to the object. So that's what I've done with uh, WP app framework, which I just pushed out to the uh, plugin directory last night. Uh, and this is the way I've been going about it in a number of my projects in building apps is to uh, you know, use this singleton to hitch everything onto. So you can get at your data from your header file, from your, uh, from your template, from uh, all of your sub-templates and sub-views that you're going to use throughout your app uh, on every page mode. Project or problem is the poor logic view separator. First solution, don't put all of your logic into functions.php. Unless you're doing a very simple site, it's really easy for functions.php to become this dumping ground for any functionality you use throughout your site. If you're going to have a lot of complexity and a lot of functionality, break it up. So you can use, uh, you can check to see if the user's on an admin page. And if so, load your functions pages, uh, or load your functions that you need on the, uh, the admin side. If they're viewing a front end page, load that functionality. If they're viewing, say, a user's profile, then you load the functionality you need to view the user's profile. You don't have to load everything every time. You can use a plugin like WP MVC or Tina MVC, uh, which are WordPress plugins that allow you to uh, use a more traditional MVC pattern within your file. Or you can build out your logic modules using my plugin, uh, the WPF framework, which allows you to add code to your, uh, your plugins or within your theme to uh, extend the logic of your application. So third problem is that metadata can be inefficient. You can't query by the meta value unless you're not. And so you know, your two options using the traditional structure, if you need to pull data by its meta value, you can either try and reformulate that into a taxonomy, which can help you uh, that way, or you can query it directly out of the table, and I know WordPress even provides a way for you to do that, but it's not recommended. Or you pull it all in with PHP and then run through it, which is obviously not very effective once you get over a couple hundred posts. So if you consider you, you've got a custom post type with 100 different associated meta values, and you have 20,000 posts, that's 2 million rows into your metadata right there, which is unnecessary, and as you grow, that just is going to grow exponentially. So if you're developing custom applications that need a lot of this 
custom data, then you need to develop custom tables that are tied to your post ID. You need to make sure that you're selecting the right uh, the right keys so that your uh, your queries can run efficiently. But the caveat here, you want to make sure that you have a good reason if you're going to be using custom tables. So if you've got a few pieces of metadata, you've got a little, uh, you know, small amount of content, don't do it. You need to cons consider the way that your app is going to scale. And if you can stay within the WordPress tables responsibly, that's great. But if your app is going to scale, if you're going to have a lot of metadata, the best time to evaluate that is at the beginning. Don't wait until your site has 100 million views and then go back and say, well, you know, we are spending $80,000 a month on database servers. So what's my plugin? Just to answer any questions there, it creates a singleton that you can use throughout your web app. So you can uh, hang your own objects onto it and access them throughout your plugins and your themes. So you can extend it. The core WP App Framework plugin on its own does very, very little. The only actual functionality that it adds is the ability for users to log in by their email addresses. Uh, aside from that, you need to write your own plugins that hook onto it. This just creates sort of this tree that you can hang your own uh, objects and your own projects off of. And hopefully it will grow to uh, add functionality to help app development uh, without adding a lot of fluff. You know, I'm not looking to eventually add admin panels to it and make it an end user type of plugin. It's meant strictly for developers who are looking to do this kind of stuff with WordPress. And if you want to help, let me know. Just remember, WordPress is not just a blog anymore, and it's not just a CMS every, anymore. With all of these updates and releases that are coming out, it's constantly getting faster. People have a lot of these preconceived notions about the weaknesses of, of WordPress. It's a constant thing that I'm hearing, and I would imagine a lot of you are too, Clients saying, I didn't know you could do that with WordPress. I thought WordPress was, that's where I blog about cute things my cat does, not that's where I, I'm developing my new internal app for my company. So I have a couple examples of ways that I've used WordPress to build these apps. And uh, the first one is sort of a, a more basic, that's closer to a, a traditional CMS usage, and then uh, a little bit more so this is a site that I've been getting ready for a client, got a class action uh, that's looking for a place for users to be able to complain about products. Uh, so yeah, it allows them to talk about issues they're having. And the neat thing that we've done here is users get an account, but they don't know it. They never get a password. They have no idea that they have an account on the system other than we can help them not have to enter their information. So the first time they come in and they post a problem, we create an account invisibly for them. We don't email them. Any email follow-up that they get, so if they opt in to receive notifications down the road, we include a, a value that lets them click the link and they're automatically logged in when they come back to the site. So if they want to post a response, they don't have to remember their password they're already logged in, even if they're on a different computer and it's three years later. Users can opt in for information if other issues are discussed regarding the company they're having problems with. So essentially, we have a custom post type here for issues that are going on, and a user can uh, respond and say, I'm also having an issue with Apple, and nothing happens with it, and then a year down the road, there's uh, a lawsuit filed against Apple, and it may not be for exactly the same thing, but the user can say, you know, I use a lot of Apple products, sometimes I have problems, I'd like to know if there's a class action coming up, and by being correlated with that company, 
they're automatically notified. And uh, yeah, like I mentioned before, they're logged back in whenever they click a link in their email. So there are no passwords to remember, but there is still a user account in place. So it's like an invisible password. The other site that's a little bit more complex here is uh, GreenZoo. And uh, this site, it's a solar proposal workbook. So what they do is they uh, uh, find companies that have large buildings, high electric bills, and come up with creative financing for them to be able to uh, install solar on their building and pay less than they were paying before uh, for traditional power. So they contact these companies, and then the, uh, the warehouses and office buildings uh, get sent a password, and they can come to WordPress and log in and submit an RFP. So they want a proposal on getting solar power on their building. The solar installers bid on the project without seeing the client's financial information. So when they fill out the initial application, they have to fill out a credit application to go with it, but we don't want the installer to be able to see that. And once the client selects an installer, then we bring in a solar financing company, and they can bid on the project. And all of this happens through WordPress, just using custom host types. And it's all password protected, so the only page you get to see if you don't have a uh, login This is the only page you get to see, it's your login page. So, the way that this is set up, you've got multiple users who belong to a client company, or multiple users that belong to an installer company or a lender company, and each one of these is a custom post type. Uh, so that company can have information, it can have a bio of the company, and different users belong to it. That link is made in the user metadata, uh, and then recursively in the, uh, the company's post metadata, so that uh, you know, if I go to an installer company, I can look at its metadata to see who the installers are, rather than have to query the user metadata table to see what users belong to that company. And so through that way, sort of work around the WordPress limitation of not being able to, uh, to query on meta values. And then each solar installation has uh, a link to a client company and then eventually an installer company once they accept the bid. Until they accept the bid, the install, install is uh, visible to all uh, installers and then a lender company once they uh, accept the bid. So you have all of these links going on between different post types and different users, which create a uh, really usable uh, web app, and uh, the, the entire app was able to be built in a couple weeks versus six months uh, if we were building everything up from scratch. So. These are just two examples. The pos possibilities are endless. And with that, I wrote down the wrong target time for our speeches, so I'm ready for questions. <laughs> of your 
web app has, has a slightly different table structure, uh, it can automatically add those columns into the, uh, into the database. Just a really simple question. How do you um, assign a custom post type to the user? So uh, the way that I've been doing that, uh, and actually I have a, another plugin that's a plugin to WP app framework called WPAF users that I've got to finish the readme on before they'll take it into the uh, plugin directory. But it, it sort of uh, is a good example of that. But when you create a user, you uh, you assign them to a company. And so that's assigned in the user's metadata and uh, then recursively in the company metadata so you can uh, link them up either way. Uh, so that, that way you can, uh, you can write your permissions based on the actual company or the company type and not just the user. So you don't have to assign every user into a pool of permissions. You can assign a whole company or a whole type of companies, like an installer company type, in that situation. Yeah. Um, could you take a, just a couple minutes and talk a little bit about the, your WP app framework plugin? Just a little bit about how you got going on it. And how did you structure it? Is it lots of PHP files? Is it one? Where does it hook in? Just, just a very quick overview of the key points of it. The entire plugin at this point is about 150 lines of code. It's, it's a very short plugin that uh, the things that it adds on are uh, the singleton, which is available as a global, so you can get to it from any other plugin or within your theme. Then you also get uh, within that it has uh, all of the paths that you will ever need uh, to get at different things. Uh, and a methodology for displaying messages. Uh, so success messages, error messages, so you can easily output messages and have a, uh, have a spot in your theme for them. At this point, that's the core functionality and, and the whole point of it is to be very lightweight and allow other plugins to hang off of it. Uh, some of the functionality on this site look, look, looks like it could have been covered by BuddyPress and I'm just wondering if you've ever had any interfaces with that before or why you may or may not have found that. You know, the, the thing that I've experienced with BuddyPress in the past and uh, to be completely honest, I haven't implemented BuddyPress in uh, about 16 months was the last site that I used on it. But the issues that I've run into are an overkill of functionality. Uh, I, I've found over and over again, you know, I've, I've gone from uh, starting out and saying, Oh, you want this? Well, let's grab a plugin for that and a plugin for this. And all of a sudden, you know, you have uh, 20 plugins installed where you're using 10% of each one of those plugins. To me, it was sort of the same uh, type of issue with BuddyPress where, you know, we don't need these groups. We don't need actual forums. What we need to do is share a piece of content uh, to these different user types. Uh, and all of the functionality built into BuddyPress would just be overkill. All right, anybody else? Do you have any sort of a, a, like a whiteboard kind of basic theme that you use with this framework? Yes, I, I tend to uh, build up from scratch and uh, I believe it's Toolbox is the automatic blank theme uh, that I almost always build up for. And that was actually something that I was uh, thinking of on the train ride down here this morning, is it, it would make a lot of sense to develop something that's even more bare bones that uh, is built to work within this framework. So I think that's in my list for the next couple of weeks. So to, to make the registration pro process invisible to users, back on the law site, I go backwards quickly, uh, when you go into, here, let me just take you over here. Oh, never mind, I can't get online. Uh, <laughs> but 
when you go into any discussion or you try to start your own, and this is one of the uh, uh, neat things that I thought I was going to be out of time with and cut from the presentation, but uh, you can type in, I'm having a problem with here. And as you type, uh, it's going to pull in company names that we already know from the database. It's, it's pre-populated with about a thousand companies. So then it says, is your issue one of the following? And uh, it, it pulls all of the existing issues with that company so you don't get a bunch of duplicate content and you don't get duplicate companies from people typing it wrong. When you uh, expose something like this to the public, you, you really have to handhold them through it so that you don't get 10 different spellings of Apple. Uh, and when you get to a more complex name, it's all over. Uh, but then once you get to that page, you fill out your name, your phone number is optional, your email, and then your zip code uh, so that they know, you know if a lawsuit is uh, applicable to you. And when you submit that form, it checks your email address to make sure you're not already in the database. If you are in the database, it says, you know, I need to send you an email just to confirm that this is really your email address and you're not pretending to be someone else. Uh, and it creates your user account. And then in any emails that are sent forward in the future, I, I create a, uh, a check value uh, that's based off of their username and their email address with a salt added uh, hash together. And we store that in the database so that it can be checked against. And if those match up, we log the user in. We don't need their password. They technically have a password, but we don't know it, they don't know it. It's, it doesn't matter. Does that make sense? So that's handled by this theme. Okay. So I, I sort of hung that functionality off of this theme. And you know, if you guys are interested in you know, being able to log in users without them having to remember their password, shoot me an email. I'm more than happy to uh, spend a couple hours throwing that into a plugin and releasing it. How, how does that work if uh, somebody goes to another system navigates to the URL, how do you handle that? So if they come straight to the URL again, the, the thing with this site is, in, in particular, is people are gonna find it when they're having a problem. And they're probably gonna forget about it until we email them and say, hey, there's an update to your problem. If there was a situation with someone coming back to the site and trying to post a follow-up without clicking a link out of their email so they're not logged in, if they have to fill out the form again, but if their email address matches, we just send them a quick email to make sure, say, you know, we, we got this post, just click this link to prove that it was actually you, and you know, it's not someone else pretending to be you, and we'll post it under your name. And obviously this, this solution is not secure. Uh, not a good solution to use anywhere where there's sensitive information, but in a situation like this where you have people having a conversation and it doesn't, you know, it's not the end of the world if someone's credentials are exposed, then it's a great solution to use because you get around the solution, around the issue of having users come back and not remember their password and get frustrated and leave. They don't have a password, they don't have to remember it. 